And Denise, just go ahead and hit that talk button one more time so that your mic turns back on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this um, webinar. I hope everyone has configured the audio. Can you hear me? You can raise your hand. Fantastic. Well, there's, first, I'd like to thank all of the sponsors that have sponsored this conference today for this, the Center for the Future of Museums. And next, this is a fun thing. You've probably done it with other sessions as well. If you click on the um, star in the toolbar to the left, you can all add our locations of where we're meeting from. So everyone, it looks like they're in uh, warm areas. We're having a, a great um, morning today. I think it's in the mid-70s. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but I'd like to welcome you. I, <coughs> I am Denise Jones. And for the first half of this presentation, I will talk about data visualization and the prototyping of using existing data with the addition of newly created relational information developed to expose and includes within each piece of art. For the second half of the presentation, Kyle Parker will talk about the mobile app, which combines the use of wayfinding and notification technologies and use the use of relational information and data visualization, plus a few extra features that we have added along the way. What do we mean by infinite art? The prototypes we have developed are places where personal interest galleries can be created that would otherwise be impossible to create within the physical environment. Our goal is to layer in information from different academic disciplines to enrich the learning experience within and outside the museum space. But first, let me introduce you to Ball State University. This is the David Owsley Museum of Art. The museum houses a diverse collection of art from around the world. It is comprised of two floors with art collections spanning several thousand years from India, China, Japan, Mesoamerica, Africa, the Americas, Oceania, and Europe. Currently, there are 1,300 pieces on display within the museum with an additional 12,000 pieces in storage. Students from architecture, art history, English, Honors College, Geography, Geology, and Fashion Design all use the museum to complete class assignments throughout the year. We also have K-12 through students regularly tour the museum on field trips. With all of these young visitors to the museum, it is critical to bring new technologies into this environment. Technology offers a way for us to organize the objects into dynamic collections for the visitor to view, to enjoy, before, during, and after their visits. And through these interactive features, technology can help make art more approachable to everyone through added facts, hints, and games, drawing features, and social interactions. So is it possible to visualize objects from different galleries in one location? Can the use of data visualization resolve these questions? The term mind map, which is in some ways similar to data visualization, was first popularized in the 1970s by British psychology author Tony Buzan. However, people's need to diagram their thoughts and ideas can be traced back to the third century. Here are two examples of knowledge maps one from the 11th century and the other from the 21st century. Produced 1,000 years apart, 
Both examples show each author's relational organization of their ideas. Diagrams, models, and maps all aid in the brain's ability to construct mental connections between known information and the new information we are trying to learn. This exercise can aid in the brain in consuming the old and new information in a format that it can better comprehend, retain, and recall the information. So naturally, to start this project, I needed to sketch a map of my initial idea. After valuable input from the museum staff, English and art history professors, several visits to the museum, and reviewing data supplied us by the museum, I created a drawn diagram similar to this graphic. So this actually shows the five, the initial five areas or categories of information that we could then create subcategories and layer in additional information from other academic disciplines. Using an extract from the museum's database, inconsistencies were found in several categories, so corrections were made before anything could be built resembling this diagram shown in the previous slide. The revisions took several weeks to complete. To build the final maps or the data visualizations, we used the software development kit from ThinkMap. We started by building the map by connecting the same categories found on the panel cards next to the artwork in the museum. We used the artist's name, title, century, period, and medium to build the map. This is the diagram with the orange highlighted areas to show what areas we've actually connected using the, the existing data from the museum. The next set of slides, I'll show you how the visual, visualizations take in shape. At a glance, you can select a category of art to view. You can search through the museum's collection by artist, period, culture, century, and artwork, and medium. At a glance, you can see 11 different relationships to the art object at the center of the focus. Graphic organizers like this map can serve to show the relationships between each category of information. This allows the visitor to explore each branch of knowledge to create personal relevance. You can compare periods of art within this example. You can see the full list of Renaissance art and those pieces which fall into the period defined by High Renaissance. And lastly, this example shows the connections that we've built between the artist and the expanded body of work the museum owns. Now I will take you to, uh, it's about a three minute movie of the actual sync map in use. So this is where I selected a category, European painting and sculpture. And from that point, I can select any piece of art along this path. So I selected um, this painting to make the center of focus, and from there I can select on any of the 11 categories, or also hide those if I choose, to show the different relationships this piece of art has to others in the collection. So at any point, you can, you can select a piece of art, bring it to the center of focus, and follow, follow the knowledge strings along the way to find out if this painting was actually oil, 
or if it was a panel, or if it was wood, or who the artists were. At some later point, we would like to add in relationships of other artists, um, other influences, the schools of thought that they um, practiced, um, all geopolitical information. Um, but, but this was a good starting point with using the existing data that we have from the museum. So if you can see all the tendrils that show which paintings within the American painting and sculpture category are oil or on canvas or in paint. And this is an example of showing the period art and which pieces are of late Renaissance, Renaissance, or Mannerist style. There's about one minute left on the movie. And this is just to show you um, how you can navigate through the collection and show the relationships to each piece within the collection. And we have about 15 seconds left. And this is where I've selected the century. And then I can also select the medium as well. Denise, there's a question there in the chat, too. Is the so What software are you using? Is it open source or free? Um, it, it isn't free. It's about, um, I believe the license is 5000 for the development kit. And then there is a learning curve. Um, we had a developer uh, work on that to actually build the map um, from the data. So does, does that answer your question? Okay. Jennifer, is that? Okay, so I'll go back to the whiteboard. So this is one part of the prototypes that we have been working on, um, applying technology to the museum um, collections. The other part um, is actually the hidden stories that can be found within the pieces of art themselves. And so working from that point, um, we started to layer in information um, that we could show an example to the museum staff, um, to the professors, so to enlist their help as well to bring more information into this um, test. So our plan is to really add more information to the museum project in progressive layers. Um, when you really think about about it, art encompasses many subjects that can impact an audience of visitors whose interests may not be in art, but they're there because, you know, the friends or parents or whatever, um, they're looking at the pieces, they may or may not appreciate the quality of work, but they're really not that interested. Um, so we're trying to, to layer in, you know, history, mathematics, science, and other humanities to make those to, to touch upon other interests that people may have and may engage their curiosity. So to initially grab a person's attention and, and um, create an, an example, we first focused on extracting the hidden clues within the artwork. Um, these clues add meaning to a piece of art and um, I hope will prompt someone's curiosity to, to further explore the museum and art in general. So this is the, the um, Western Gallery in our museum. And the focus is the, the four panel structures. It's really because of the, the size and their beauty, these also panels are the focal point within this gallery. 
yet I um, want to show you an example of the card that is next to um, those four beautiful panels. Um, as you can see or read from the description, you were told, you know, the center panel is missing from the collection, how the panels were displayed and used in the church, the subject matter, and who commissioned the work. But nothing is really written about the painting itself. So if you think about your trips to the museum, you know, they may have been during a, a popular exhibit and it's crowded and you may or may not be able to get close to this um, descriptive card. And then once you do, you really don't find out a lot about the painting itself. So for the next few slides, we're going to focus on the, the panel of St. John the Evangelist and, and slowly uncover some details that can be found in the painting that may have been overlooked by the visitor. So these are just some of the, you know, there is an eagle in this panel um, and there's meaning behind, you know, why this, this um, bird was painted within the panel itself. There are opportunities to really engage visitors' interests by pulling out those small details found within the, found within the object itself. You know, the meaning behind the flowers, the, you know, bugs that are on the ground have significant meaning, the birds that are in the background that may have been missed by a casual visitor. All of these details can add interest to the piece of art and may, maybe um, inspire the person to investigate it further after they leave. So here are the all four panels together and the next slide shows all of the opportunities within these panels to engage a visitor's curiosity. So with that, I am turning the presentation over to Kyle Parker who will talk about the mobile app that was created which combines the use of wayfinding and notification technologies with relational information, data visualization, plus a few extra features. Kyle? Hello everyone. So I'm going to step through the mobile application we're developing that's using this information that Denise was talking about. So it uh, will pull in portions of the data visualization which were intended for the web. It will pull in these details and these other layers of content that we're trying to add to the art for a visitor to be able to read about both in the museum and prior to coming for a visit. So this is the first screen and at the end of this I'll have a short video just walking through the different aspects of the app. But this is the initial screen that a visitor would be presented with upon launching the application. We've got it broken down into theme and gallery based tours. The theme, um, after speaking with an art history professor, we came up with this idea rather than going with the standard or traditional gallery based themes as the initial introduction to the museum, we would use this theme idea and that would be able to pull in artwork from the various galleries and from the various floors of the museum into a, a consistent theme throughout that tour. So those themes would consist of maybe a dozen pieces of art to navigate the person through the museum. We'd also allow them to build their own tour under the My Art tab in the top right corner there. With that, we would be able to use the data visualization and as their mapping their way through the different pieces of art, they would be able to select a piece or a, um, a movement or a material or different aspects of the artwork and build their own tour and then be able to share that with family and friends. So here is the uh, screenshot of based on galleries. So these are the different galleries within the museum that would include every piece of art within that particular space. And here we see a detail screen. So this is after you've picked a, a tour. You come and start walking around the museum. 
And I'm going to talk about the wayfinding portion that would prompt you to view this information on the mobile device. So this is going to show you the detail of a particular piece of art. We've got a, a large photo, and in the video you'll see this got some movement so you can see more of the piece of art. Below that are various images of that piece of art, whether it be the back of the frame, an inset, or with sculptures, it may be the back or the side of that piece of artwork. Below that, just the basic label information, so the date, the material, the dimensions, and pretty much the same information you would see if you were in the physical space. Then, as Denise was talking earlier, these call-outs or these details that are in the piece of art, those are going to appear on the right side of the screen, where you see um, the Madonna and Child, the building in the background, and the trees. Those are just some of the different pieces of that art that may not be recognized or may not be seen if you're walking through the space and just casually looking at it. So this allows us to call out the specific pieces of that artwork and, and show that content to the visitor. It also gives us the opportunity to compare. So we've got two Madonna and Childs here that we're comparing two different portions of that painting and being able to see similarities or even differences that may exist between different artists, different time periods, but looking at similar subjects. And this content is not part of the standard museum uh, collection. This is the content that we're working to curate with art history students, uh, English students, and their professors, and trying to build those additional layers on top of your standard sort of museum database information. One of the more interesting things um, we hope to be able to do with this particular app we're using the Samsung uh, tablet that has the stylus. So this would allow visitors to pull in a piece of art and sketch on it, draw on, draw on it, annotate. They could pull in other photos that they may want to compare and do their own mapping or comparisons between artwork. Uh, but it gives them the ability to sort of do something more with that art and be able to make their own connections and add additional detail to the artwork. So now I'm going to talk about the location and the wayfinding that we're bringing into this project. So we are going through and geotagging or identifying with the latitude and longitude and elevation where each piece exists within the museum. Those are going to be identified with little markers on our map of both the first floor and second floor of the museum. And with those, you'll be able to, as an example here, the Madonna and Child, you can see my blue dot. That's where I'm currently at in the museum space. I've identified that, that artwork. And now I can click on that, and that's going to take me to that detail screen. So the blue dot is that location piece that we're adding in. Uh, most people are familiar with GPS. Well, this is going to be indoor positioning. So we're using a, a technology to provide location indoors roughly within about three meters. So what this allows us to do is with this app, we can do both location data indoors and outdoors. So it's not, the tour doesn't have to begin and end at the front door of the museum. We can include other aspects of our campus such as the parking garage down there in the bottom right-hand corner, or uh, outdoor spaces like Christie Woods and the greenhouse over on the right or the left side of the image. We also have a bus stop there. Our library has special collections that sometimes tie to artwork in the museum. So we're able to bring in those other elements, and we can create the tours and the wayfinding to do both inside the museum space and outside with other artwork and other locations on the campus. So as an example here, we have some sculptures outside of the museum. And again, those would be able to be part of the sculpture tour or the abstract tour, depending on what the, the theme or gallery may entail. So now to do that indoor positioning, what we've done is use 
Bluetooth Low Energy Beacons. Um, some people may have heard of the iBeacons from um, Apple. These are similar. They're um, using Bluetooth, and we've placed about 40 beacons throughout the 25,000 square feet of our museum. The cost is relatively inexpensive. It's only $60 per beacon, and there's no ongoing maintenance. The battery is estimated to last for about three years. And as I mentioned, we're hoping for accuracy around three meters. So we're going to hope we're going to get people close to the piece of art. And then with the images and the other information on the tablet, take them, take them those next couple of steps. It will also let us know where they are to be able to push additional content that we may have to them. So as you can see, here's an example of our placement. So they're very small. They're um, thankfully not really noticeable, hopefully not noticeable to the museum guests. We didn't want technology to get in the way and um, obscure their appreciation of the art. So down there below that one case is a small device. Um, we're able to place those anywhere between the ground level and up to about 20 feet. This is new technology, so it is something that we're experimenting with to see where is the best position within the museum. So we do have several, pretty much in every spot we can find. We have some up near the top of the ceiling, near cornices. Um, some are at the bottom, as you can see here in this photo. In the next image, we have some that are going with um, other control units that may be on the wall already. So they're on the left. We've got a thermostat and um, some other control panels within that particular gallery. The one on the right, again, is down near the bottom, tucked underneath the corner of a case. Others we've been able to put inside of the glass cases, so behind a piece of art or behind a sculpture or a piece of pottery, so they really are invisible to the, the visitor and they're not detracting from the appreciation of the art. To do this, we used um, the company as Polestar is where we've purchased these beacons, and they provide us a tool that we map out the indoor space and where we're going to position the beacons. And those beacons, we, we identify them, we sort of test out the path, and those are plotted using latitude, longitude, and elevation. Elevation is used to identify which floor of the building we're on. So as we transition up the stairs, the next set of beacons on that floor are going to start responding and providing that location data. The key element of this to do both those indoor and outdoor tours is we're using Google Maps, the API for Google Maps, to be able to bridge that gap. So we've overlaid the floor plan of our museum on a standard Google Map and the blue dot will pick up using GPS when we're outside and seamlessly transition to a blue dot on the inside using these beacons. Again, it's going to be approximate. We're not going to get exact just because of the technology that's available right now. They do hope in the future to get it down to a meter or less. There are new technologies out there using LED. Um, the gyroscope and other sensors on the device. So there's a lot of different options that are going to be available in the future for this location and wayfinding data. And as I mentioned, this is an experiment for us. We've not done it before. So we're, we're learning how, how dense, how many of these beacons do we need in a space to accurately identify position and location. So you can see we've got two galleries roughly the same size at 2,100 square feet. The one on the, the right, we're deploying eight beacons in there. The one on the left, we're just doing four. So we're trying to see which one is going to work best. Is there a sweet spot in terms of where we get the best location data based on the number of beacons we've deployed? So right now, the initial focus is on Android. We're researching an iOS version, but um, we're just Myself and the developer that's working on this, we're just more comfortable on Android. We've done more projects on that, and it's just been easier to deploy. It is available for iOS 7. The beacons work in that environment as well. So we are researching that and hoping to develop a prototype 
on the iOS side of things. So we've got this initial prototype developed. It identifies our location. We can watch the blue dot move around the space as we move through the museum. But now we want to tie more content to that. We want to do something else with just knowing where we are inside of the museum. So as I mentioned, we're going to start layering in other content whether that be curated by students, the instructors, and even the community members. So it's not going to be just the museum or the data from the museum. It's not going to just be what they think is interesting or useful or relevant. It's going to be able to come in from multiple contributors at the university and outside. We're going to pull in those other subjects. So when you're looking at a painting, you can see more than just what that label is telling you. And then be able to include additional content that may extend the understanding of that piece of art, whether that be a video clip or audio, um, the sketches you're going to be able to do, additional photos, maybe other artists, and just notes that you want to be able to take as you're looking at that piece of art so you may stimulate other thoughts and other um, ideas that you have about it. And then we're going to do um, tours that we've got the theme, we've got the gallery, but maybe there's a tour that's specifically for a class. So an instructor would be able to go in and develop their own tour that's going to target what the, last, the lesson plan or the syllabus may call for for that semester's class. Community recommendations. So if you've got um, family and friends that have gone to the museum, they can recommend a new piece of art or a gallery or something that you want to, um, that you should go see and visit. As Denise said, we're trying to bring in some games and some fun stuff, too. So one of the ideas is a scavenger hunt. So we'll take snippets of paintings or sculptures or whatever piece of art and pull those together in a, a package of like things and have the scavenger hunt with hints and, again, showing your location on the map and then the warmer, the hot and cold sort of game. So as you wander around the museum, you can look for we've got here the hands. So where is that hand at? And as you can see, the hint tries to help point you in the direction of which piece you want to look for. Um, so it's building that knowledge of the art, as well as just having some fun. And we're hoping to bring in the leaderboard concept, the achievements, and be able to make it a fun game that you can share um, maybe with a class or with some friends. The other aspect of that is, as I was talking about with the location, pushing information to the user based on where they are. So we have, we know who you are because you've logged into this application. We're going to have preferences where you can identify what it is you like. If you're a student, we're going to know what classes you're in, so what focus you're going to have as you're visiting the museum and while you're there. And as you move around the space, We'll see where you are. We'll know where the artwork is. We know what you like. We're going to be able to push recommendations and other items to you that you may not have known about otherwise. So maybe there's a new piece of art coming in tomorrow or a new another piece from the same artist. This is the type of information we want to be able to use this location data and, and push us to the user. Um, since I'm a tech guy, I love playing around with the new technology that's coming out. So trying to find a, a functional and applicable way to use this technology as part of the project and something that's really going to help the visitors. So hope to incorporate companion devices like the smartwatch, especially with the scavenger hunt. So rather than having to look at the phone or look at the tablet, you just look at your watch and it's going to buzz or notify you um, without hot and cold notice, as well as being able to see hints, short hints, and then um, the additional images or portions of the image that may help you find that piece of artwork as you're going around. So I happen to have a couple of these watches. I've um, been able to do some testing and playing around with them. And it's, uh, it's an interesting way of using the device and the technology to, again, get it out of the way. So rather than walking around holding out my tablet, holding out my phone, I have a watch. It's a natural look to look down at my watch rather than having to pull out one of those devices. 
The other piece is using Google Glass. We also have a couple of glass, pair of glass here on campus, and researching and um, experimenting with how these could be used, again, with a scavenger hunt idea, having that heads up notification and not having to dig around for a device and being able to appreciate the art without technology really getting in the way. So now I have a short video, like I said, that's going to just walk through the, the application. It's a, about two minutes, and then after that, we can do some questions and answers. So again, this is just walking through that initial screen. We're going to go on the religion tour. And below that, you see the pieces of art that are part of that tour. In the top corner, I've got my map identifying where all those pieces of art are located. And as I cycle through the, the artwork, it's going to pop to that location where that piece is at. And here's our detail screen. Up there in the top right corner, you can see the standard options that are available with um, on the device. You can share this with family and friends via email or Facebook. Or I can go into the sketching utility and start drawing on that piece of art. We can also zoom in to the different views of the piece. We'll have information about the artist, what their inspiration was, what their um, the movement they were involved in, and what their influences were for that particular piece of artwork. With this particular tablet, it does have a pressure sensitive pen, so it's really similar to drawing with normal paper and pencil or markers. You're able to choose from a variety of colors and pen types and really get that you can tell I'm a great artist. Um, I was able to just color in her, her robe with another color of blue. But here I'm bringing in another piece. So this is another Madonna and Child that I'm going to use for comparison between the two pieces of art. And again, this is just additional information and additional content that the user can interact with to help sort of solidify that art or make that experience memorable. And then this next will just pop into one of the galleries. And again, it's the same sort of setup. The theme was going to span multiple galleries. The gallery is just going to be that particular um, space within the museum. So that is the end of our presentation. We will open things up for questions. And thank you for, for joining us. Thank you so much, you guys. And um, everyone else, if you have a question, you can go ahead and raise your hand. And we can give you microphone privileges if you want to ask your question. Otherwise, you can type it in the chat there at the bottom. As we're uh, waiting for people to think of great things to ask, OK, here we got a couple coming through. So the timeline, um, Denise, when did we start on this? Just a couple of months ago, right? Yes, it's been about um, three to four months. So the most difficult part, I think, of this was the, the data that we received from the museum. Just trying to go through and make it make it useful in the in the sense of more than just a label. So that's been, I think, in terms of development of a timeline 
that's been the thing that's taken the, the longest amount is just going through the data and trying to clean it up and make it make it fit inside of this new sort of idea, both within ThinkMap and on the mobile side. And um, to answer Michael's question about um, encouraging physical visits, um, right now that is, is um, the marketing part is left up to uh, the museum staff. But we do throughout the year have, have several um, uh, good sized classes, probably 30, 30 at a time, um, students walking through there. Um, it's very crowded through the week. Um, so, so uh, you know, and they've got, they establish um, uh, workshops for children throughout the summer, and they've got a good uh, relationship with the community. So we have a lot of visitors um, off campus or coming to the museum as well. Um, one thing we did discuss, you know, we don't want people um, having the tablet and just staring at the tablet, and then they totally not look at the piece of art in front of them. So that's part of the notification um, piece that we're going to, you know, every once in a while um, have a little notification come up, say, look up, <laughs> look up the piece of art. Um, so that's uh, another thing that we uh, plan to add as well. And hopefully with the additional elements we're adding into, like the, with a the mobile app, that will encourage people to, to visit the space rather than just visiting online. So with the scavenger hunt, being able to walk through the space and the location beacons, knowing where you are, knowing where you're trying to get to, and those would automatically be able to do the hot and cold sort of thing. So doing things within the space that you wouldn't be able to do if you were sitting at your house on the, on the website. So are there any more questions? All right, thanks so much, you guys. Um, this has been really great. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Amy. Thanks, everyone. And Denise, just go ahead and hit that talk button one more time so that your mic turns back on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this um, webinar. I hope everyone has configured the audio. Can you hear me? You can raise your hand. Fantastic. Well, there's, first I'd like to thank all of the sponsors that have sponsored this conference today for the, the Center for the Future of Museums. And next, this is a fun thing, you've probably done it with other sessions as well. If you click on the um, star in the toolbar to the left, you can all add our locations of where we're meeting from. So everyone, it looks like they're in, um, what actually shows the five, the initial five areas or categories of information that we could then create subcategories and layer in additional information from other academic disciplines. Using an extract from the museum's database, inconsistencies were found in several categories so corrections were made before anything could be built resembling the diagram shown in the previous slide. The revisions took several weeks to complete, 
To build the final maps or the data visualizations, we use the software development kit from ThinkMap. We started by building the map by connecting the same categories found on the panel cards next to the artwork in the museum. We used the artist's name, title, century, period, and medium to build the map. This is the diagram with the orange highlighted areas to show what areas we've actually connected using the, the existing data from the museum. The next set of slides, I'll show you how the visualizations take in shape. At a glance, you can select a category of several thousand years from India, China, Japan, Mesoamerica, Africa, the Americas, Oceania, and Europe. Currently, there are 1,300 pieces on display within the museum with an additional 12,000 pieces in storage. Students from architecture, art history, English, honors college, geography, geology, and fashion design all use the museum to complete class assignments throughout the year. We also have K through 12 students regularly tour the museum on field trips. With all of these young visitors to the museum, it is critical to bring new technologies into this environment. Technology offers a way for us to organize the objects into dynamic collections for the visitor to view, to enjoy, before, during, and after their visits. And through these interactive features, technology can help make art more approachable to everyone through added facts, hints, and games, drawing features, and social interactions. So is it possible to visualize objects from different galleries in one location? Can the use of data visualization resolve these questions? The term mind map, which is in some ways similar to data visualization, was first popularized in the 1970s by British psychology author Tony Buzan. However, people's need to diagram their thoughts and ideas can be traced back to the third century. Here are two examples of knowledge maps, one from the 11th century and the other from the 21st century. Produced 1,000 years apart, both examples show each author's relational organization of their ideas. Diagrams, models, and maps all aid in the brain's ability to construct mental connections between known information and the new information we are trying to learn. This exercise can aid in the brain in consuming the old and new information in a format that it can better comprehend, retain, and recall the information. So naturally, to start this project, I needed to sketch a map of my initial idea. After valuable input from the museum staff, English and art history professors, several visits to the museum, and reviewing data supplied us by the museum, I created a drawn diagram similar to this graphic. So this orange areas, we're having a great um, morning today. I think it's in the mid-70s is absolutely beautiful, um, but I'd like to welcome you. I, <coughs> I am Denise Jones, and for the first half of this presentation, I will talk about data visualization and the prototyping of using existing data with the addition of newly created relational information developed to expose the hidden clues within each piece of art. For the second half of the presentation, Kyle Parker will talk about the mobile app which combines the use of wayfinding and notification technologies and use the use of relational information and data visualization, plus a few extra features that we have added along the way. What do we mean by infinite art? The prototypes we have developed are places where personal interest galleries can be created 
that would otherwise be impossible to create within the physical environment. Our goal is to layer in information from different academic disciplines to enrich the learning experience within and outside the museum space. But first, let me introduce you to Ball State University. This is the David Owsley Museum of Art. The museum houses a diverse collection of art from around the world. It is comprised of two floors with art collections spanning 